recording. Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to our seminar today. So our speaker is Richard Henchman, who's a lecturer at the Manchester Institute of Biotechnology and the Department of Chemistry at the University of Manchester. And he's going to talk to us today about analyzing molecular systems for their entropy. Okay. Thank you very much, Sarah. And it's a pleasure to be here and a chance to give this presentation um, to talk about my research. Right, so I'll talk about a method to calculate the entropy of molecular systems, considering every degree of freedom of the system. And here's a summary of my talk. I'll be talking about a new method called multi-scale cell correlation, which is a new way to calculate entropy I'll talk about two applications of the method as well, one to host guest binding and another one to the case of proteins. So the reason why entropy is so important is first of all, it relates to the stability Well, entropy relates to also the probability, probability distribution function of, of all the coordinates in the system. So the first equation here is showing you how the entropy relates to the probability distribution function, P log P times KB, which makes it thermodynamic. That's the well-known equation for entropy. Now, the problem with this equation, while it's exact in principle, is that these probabilities are tiny for large systems and they're very difficult to evaluate in large complex systems. If you can get entropy, you can calculate the Gibbs free energy directly using this equation from thermodynamics, the Gibbs energy, which governs stability, equals the enthalpy minus T, Ts. Now enthalpy is straightforward to get from a simulation apart from convergence noise issues, but that can generally be sorted out in a long enough simulation. Now for typical biomolecular systems though, there is still no general viable method to calculate the entropy over the whole system. That includes the proteins, water molecules, ions, and for membrane proteins, for example, all the lipid molecules, like in this example here. And if anybody knows of one, then let me know because I'd like to know about it. But as far as I know, I've not yet seen one being used. Only generally, people look at distribution functions for particular degrees of freedom to analyze flexibility, but not the full distribution over all the structures. So I'm going to talk about a method that can, we think, scale to these kinds of system. I won't talk about the case of a membrane protein today because we haven't quite got that far just yet, but we're pretty close now. So the feature, one of the first features of this method is that it's multi-scale because flexibility happens over multiple length scales in biomolecular systems. Pretty much almost all entry methods are generally only at one length scale or not really um, over many length scales. And so this is a key feature to have. This just shows the typical rugged landscape of a biomolecule with a stable minimum, but many other local minima at higher energy. The next key feature of the method is it's, it uses what's called um, a cell approximation. So this is very well known in the case of confirmation when you might have a trans confirmation and a gauche confirmation for the molecule like butane with these different energy wells uh, for confirmation. But it also occurs at the molecular level when you discretize configuration space into local energy wells according to environments of the molecule in terms of non-bonded degrees of freedom. But it's the same idea as for conformational degrees of freedom. So that's the second key idea in this method. And the third key idea is correlation. So all these methods, of course, are well known, but we're putting them all together into a single method to address these large scale systems. So correlation typically involves using a covariance matrix of some kind. It could be coordinate fluctuation or Hessians or in our case, forces. And the eigenvalues and I, or the eigenvectors give you the kind of um, collective motions of the molecule and the eigenvalues give you the vibrational frequencies in the harmonic approximation. So these are the three ideas we're gonna combine in our method. Now I'll talk about the general equation for the method. So there's a pretty simple equation for how this method works. We've got a, a summation over four terms. The first summation is over all the molecules in the system. So we're adding up the entropy for each molecule one at a time. The second summation is over all the levels in the system. So we're summing at the whole molecule level, 
for protein, it's residue level and also united atom level. Then we look at all the different kinds of motion. There's either rotation or translation. And then we look at the entropy over the cells or the energy wells in the system. So we have two possible kinds of term there. One relating to the average size of the energy wells called the vibrational entropy and another term relating to the occupancy of all the different energy wells. And we call that the topographical entropy as a general kind of word encapsulating conformation or position and so on. So you have a summation of these four terms, you evaluate the entropy at each of those degrees of freedom. And this approximation is pretty much tantamount to assuming that the probability distribution function is a product of terms for each of these four kinds of degrees of freedom. So this of course is simple in principle, but in practice, how do you make this approximation valid and work? And that's been with the whole progression of this theory is that you're running a molecular dynamic simulation and you're trying to pick out how much of each of these kinds of motion there is, getting the respective probability distribution function and then getting the entropy from that. So now I'll go through the general terms, the, the theory for each of these terms. Uh, so let's, let's look first of all at the case, I shall go more into just how this works for the case of a molecule in solution. So here we use two length scales, for example. So we have the molecule length scale for this molecule and also for the water molecules and the united atom length scale, which is each heavy atom with its connected hydrogens treated as a rigid body, not a point particle as a rigid body. Um, and that's basically the idea of this theory is we're treating each system the, the system is a, is a composition of multiple length scale, um, rigid bodies and multiple length scales. So we have vibrational entropy, translation and rotation for each of the length scales. And we have the topographical entropy. And we tend to try and use the common words for the topographical entropy. So at the United Atom level, it's conformational entropy. Uh, for, the topic, for the molecular level, we talk about position or orientation of the whole molecule. Just one point about the United Atom level, we ignore the vibrations inside a United Atom, which correspond to hydrogen atom in motion, because it's a very high frequency and have almost no entropy at ambient temperature. So we can basically ignore the internal entropy of a United Atom and therefore simplify the system somewhat. So mathematically, we write this like, write it like this, the solid entropy has molecule entropy, vibrational and topographical, and also United Atom entropy vibrational and topographical. And the solvent water just has the molecule entropy times all the water molecules. That's just the way I'm choosing to average them right now is all the same. Typically we only consider the first shell of the solute because uh, the, too many molecules make the quantity quite noisy. So we just, and also these more distant water molecules do not contribute very much uh, to the solvation because they're generally pretty bulk like anyway. So that's how we apply this equation for the case of a solute in water. Now I'll talk about how we evaluate the terms. So the vibrational term, first of all, at the molecule level. So we use the force to characterize the shape of the energy well. And we use correlation of forces. So for the whole molecule level, there's only three degrees of freedom, X, Y, and Z. So we have a three by three force covariance matrix which is F1, F1, or Fx times Fx. These are actually mass weighted forces rather than just the straight forces, which simplifies the mathematics for large molecules. And um, we have the rotational equivalent in terms of torques. So we have a torque covariance matrix. We get the torques and the, and the forces, which come from this MD simulation. And now the, the reason why we use forces, there's a number of reasons. In principle, you can use any quantity for a harmonic oscillator. But forces are nice because they average over all the different kinds of energy wells uh, with no real effort to do so, which makes them very uh, clean to use. And another very useful attribute is that they avoid the need to define an external reference frame, which for a liquid is very problematic because of the very disordered solvation shell, which would provide a very awkward reference frame for a molecule. So just using forces, we only care about the force in the molecule to tell us about the shape of the energy well not the environment of it directly, although we still consider the environment later on. Once you have these matrices, you diagonalize them, like for any covariance method, to get the eigenvalues, 
and then relate those to the vibrational frequency in the harmonic approximation. So we are making the harmonic approximation, but that is very useful to do because it means we can use the quantum harmonic oscillator equation, which first of all gives quantum states. And it's also very important to be able to do that for covalent bonds, which are high frequency degrees of freedom and would give unphysical entropies for high frequencies. In other words, negative entropies for very high frequency motions if we only considered classical formulations instead of quantum formulations. So it is an approximation in the harmonic equation expression, but it does bring about this uh, really important feature. For non-bonded degrees of freedom, the, the, the motion is not very high frequency typically because of the weaker forces. Um, but for the internal entropy, it does matter. Now the key feature of this method is that it's basically the same. We try and make it the same for every kind of motion. So at the United Atom level, it's essentially the same theory, but just now with uh, force, a force covariance matrix with three n by three n degrees of freedom. So it's now a much larger matrix. But it's still not that large because there's only like this molecule. There's uh, perhaps 10, 10 United atoms, so it's a thirty by thirty matrix. And we do the same for rotation. We have the torques on the United atoms, which might be slightly less than three per atom because some of them might be linear nitrogen atoms with only one hydrogen or having no hydrogens as well. So that matrix can be a bit smaller than 3n by 3n. So we use, we use this n prime. So as before, we diagonalize these matrices to get the eigenvalues. We remove this time the six lowest eigenvalues to avoid the duplication at the higher length scale, which is the whole molecule level for translation and rotation. That's just for the force covariance matrix. We take out the six lowest frequencies to avoid duplication at, at this length scale we just talked about, the molecule length scale. Then we get the entropy in the exact same way as before with the harmonic oscillator quantum formulation for each of those vibrations. That's the vibrational term. Now let's consider the topographical term. This is the term relating to the number of, or the distribution of energy wells. So the confirmation at the United Atom level, this basically is the confirmational entropy, another word for that which is a very familiar concept. And the way we get the entropy is by calculating discrete rotomer sets. So how many times each flexible rotomer, um, all of them are, have a given probability from the simulation. So if there's three, rot three dihedrals and a particular set of rotomers, we get the probability of, that rot of all those rotomers and put that into this equation. So there's nothing that new about this. This is one of the reasons why we discretize rather than using, the continuous, using continuous coordinates because this is a much simpler formulation than doing this in the high dimensions of all the confirmations. So we discretize into discrete confirmations and get a very simple formulation. Now, one feature that's important to have is that for our complicated molecules or with com complex functional groups, it's not always obvious where the energy wells are. So we use this flexible or adaptive method we discretize, we first of all measure the dihedral distribution from the simulation and then assign each confirmation to its nearest peak. So for this methyl or e, sorry, um, phenyl group twist, there's typically only two confirmations for that in this case. So each confirmation gets assigned to the two rotomers and there's only two states to consider. Whereas for a typical hydrocarbon type functional group in each side of the dihedral, you get three confirmations they get picked up by the distribution and then we assign them to those. And so we know automatically how many dihedrals or confirmations there are without having to know in advance. So the idea of the molecule level is really quite similar, except that we're discretizing rather than by internal steric clash, we're discretizing by the environment of the molecule. So in this case, it's the size of the surrounding solvent for a molecule in solution. So for translation, this defines the positional entropy, which is essentially how many positions, how many uh, discrete places does the molecule kind of vibrate in, in the solution. So the position, the, the volume is discretized by the size of the solvent molecule, basically. So in this case, it's the standard volume at whatever concentration you're using. In this case, one molar, which corresponds to 1661 cubic angstroms divided by the volume of, a, volume of a water molecule. 
which gives about log 55, the concentration of water. So that's really the number of positions of one molar. Now we consider the rotational term, which is called the orientational entropy. So that relates to, again, it's the same idea. We discretize by the surrounding solvent molecules. Here we, calculate, we do that by calculating the coordination number, how many molecules surround this solvent. And in two dimensions of rotation, that will just correspond to, well, just rotation in, yeah, in, in two dimensions. So imagine the whole solvation shell, this solid, each water molecule roughly corresponds to a, corresponds to a different position. So, but in three dimensions, a molecule can rotate also about its axis. There's also an additional degree of freedom. So we have NC, the coordination number to the power three over two. That's basically the, the approximation we make times this uh, term pi a half, just to account for um, the, the, the spherical nature of rotational coordinates. And we divide by the symmetry number in case there's any symmetry, typically there isn't. So this theory is pretty crude, but it doesn't really matter that much uh, in the overall accuracy. But there isn't very much theory out there really for discretizing uh, rotational space or translational space of a molecule in solution. But it's a lot simpler than having to do coordinate distributions, which are high dimensional and, diff and very difficult to do uh, for complicated systems. Now, we're looking at a host gas system in this work. And in the case of a host, this host we're looking at, um, the, the number of orientations for the guest depends upon the symmetry of the host. So this host actually has eightfold symmetry in its, about this axis and twofold symmetry in the plane or flipping over the, through the plane. So there's actually 16 orientations of a molecule when it's bound in the host. So that's the theory we're using now for the orientation entropy for molecule bound to a host or in solution. So that is now the entropy for this theory. Oh, sorry, the theory for this entropy. Vibrational terms and topographical terms. And now we're going to apply this to the first case, which we just recently done this work. That was in this challenge, sample late, which is the statistical assessment of the modeling of proteins and ligands. It's a, a series of challenges running for a number of years now on predicting properties of molecules like salvation free energies or PKAs or binding or partition coefficients. A number of properties um, primarily run by David Mobley at the University of California, Irvine. And this case was host gas binding for these drugs of abuse. So these well-known drugs binding to this eightfold symmetry host I mentioned earlier called CB8. So this is the simulation protocol. So this is a pretty um, standard setup using gas force field, uh, tip pre pee water, uh, docking with auto, auto dock for the guests, Gromax simulation package, standard equilibration, NPT ultimately, and then 100 nanoseconds of data collection. And the Gibbs free energy is calculated by basically running simulations of the host guest complex, a box of water, the guest in water and the host in water, and then taking the difference of the Gibbs energies of each of these. So host and guest, pure water, minus the host and the guest. That's the basic theory, the approach to get the Gibbs energy. Now let's see how we do. So generally we did reasonably well. This is the experimental, these are the seven guests. These are the values from experiment. And these are our values from our comp computation. And this is just the same data plotted with some statistical errors. So these are, these are the errors. I didn't say these were simulations are run in triplicate. So this is just the standard deviation for the three values, three, three different simulations. So the mean average error is one kcal per mole, which is respectable, not could be more accurate, compared to other methods uh, in the sample challenge. But for this kind of method, there's, it is pretty reasonable. And really, what is the main? I mean, we're, we're satisfied with this level. There are some limitations, which I'll get into, primarily with the solvent uh, being a difficult term. But it's pretty good. And the most, the most helpful part about this method isn't just the value we get out from the Gibbs energy binding, but it's all the uh, understanding we can get out from the entropy contributing to the binding. So we're going to look at now the entropy components 
basically these summation terms I mentioned earlier. So first of all, let's look at the host and guest entropy components. So here we have the host entropy at the molecule level and the host entropy at the nitrogen atom level with the two different colors, dark blue or aqua, corresponding to translation. We use this word transvibrational just to make clear it's vibrational, but it's translation as well. Or very vibrational, which is translate vibration, but now very rotational. You can see the host doesn't really change that much in entropy for these terms. It's a pretty small contribution overall. Just a slight decrease is what seems to happen when, when the guest binds, constraining the host a tiny bit. For the guest molecule, so this is the molecule level versus the united atom level. So the guest obviously loses a lot of entropy when it binds because it goes from the standard state one molar concentration to now bound in a localized spot. And also its orientation is now much more restricted. So these are the main two terms that contribute to the entropy loss. And that's pretty similar for all the guests really. There's just some small differences in the vibrational terms at the molecule level. Some small differences in vibrational terms at the nitrogen atom level, but there is the expected loss in conformational entropy. Um, that's, I should have put a label for that there. This is this or orange term is uh, yeah, conformational entropy at the nitrogen atom level. So the more flexible guests do lose more entropy, but it isn't the major term compared to the loss of the translation and rotation at the molecule level. So that's the host and guest components. Now we consider the water components. So we're gonna break up the water into four kinds of term. We've got the water that stays with the host. So some of the water is salvation the host when it's, when it's just the host. And some of the water continues to stay with the host when the guest binds. So it's like the water on the outside of the host. Now that water primarily, that water does, then we, before I go into it, well, that's okay. The water around the host stays with the host generally seems to lose a bit of row vibrational entropy, which is kind of interesting. It was not entirely expected. There's some moderate loss. The water that stays with the guest, and that's not very much entropy or very much water because most of the water around the guest gets removed when it binds. But there's a small amount at the top and the bottom. And there's some variability with that water, a bit, mostly down, but a few guests do gain, well, generally they gain vibrational, but they might lose some orientation and they might lose some trans vibration. Uh, but as for the orientational entropy for the water molecules, sorry, sorry, as for the water that leaves the host into bulk or leaves the guest into bulk, so this is the water that is freed from the surface, goes into bulk, there's a large gain in orientational entropy in both cases, larger for the guest which loses more water, loses, which has more water getting desolvated than for the host. And generally for the, for the host, there's a slight gain in that. So for the water that leaves the host, it's a slight gain in trans vibration, whereas for the guest, it sort of goes up and down a bit. So you can see, we get pretty nice insight into how the entropy contributes to the binding process. There's generally a large gain in entropy of water, as you would expect typically from other studies and general principle of the hydrophobic effect, the water gains entropy, and that's compensated by the guest losing entropy. Um, overall, there's a slight loss of entropy. I didn't put that figure in the overall Gibbs binding free energy, but to a large degree, there's a big cancellation between what the guest loses and what the solvent gains. So, right, so now we'll go to the third case. So this is the protein. Case. So we're looking at a protein now in water, but in this theory, in this project, we only consider the protein entropy. We hadn't yet put it together with the solvent entropy. We are now doing that. But for this project, for this topic right here now, I'll just talk about scaling the entropy to a protein. So it's a very similar kind of idea. We just now have, we have always the vibrational and topographical term, but we have three length scales now. We have the molecule length scale, the residue length scale, and the nitrogen atom length scale. Now we're gonna only consider four of these terms in this study, the vibrational term at every length scale and the topographical term at the nitrogen atom length scale, which is the conformational term. We're not considering the topographical term at the residue level. So this is like, imagine you've got these beads of residues just rearranging, which might be quite substantial for a folding protein or a, 
very disordered protein. But for a pretty stable protein, we're assuming that term is small and can be ignored. We have got ideas for theory of that, but that won't be presented in this work. The topographical term at the monocle level is fairly trivial for a protein, so we'll just leave that up for now. But it's, it's like it's the same for the molecule. But it is quite large because the number of positions around a protein, the number of solvent molecules is very large, but it's still a small term overall. So we have these four entropy terms, as I just discussed, the ones in blue, three vibrational and one topographical. So this theory is very similar to before. We have the vibrational term at the protein level, these three by three covariance matrices in force and in torque, eigenvalues, frequencies, harmonic entropy, the quantum formulation. We now have the same kind of approach, but in terms of residue forces. So this is, I should say, the, just to be clear, these forces are now the forces at the molecular level, it's the force on the whole protein, summed over all the, all the constituent atoms. At the residue level, the force on a residue is the sum of the forces over all the atoms in the residue. And then we do the covariance of those forces um, over all the residues in the protein. So this, if there's 100 residues, there'll be a 300 by 300 matrix for the forces and, and similarly for the torques, which are all nonlinear typically for a protein. We get the eigenvalues from diagonalization, frequencies, and then entropy for each of those degrees of freedom, each of those vibrations. And again, the same idea at the nitrogen atom level, going to the residue. So now we just consider the vibration of each of the amino acids, each of the nitrogen atoms in a given amino acid. We diagonalize eigenvalues. We remove the six lowest, I should have said that before, we remove the six lowest eigenvalues before to avoid double counts in the high level. But it's one key feature of this method at the nitrogen atom level, we've ignored the correlations between bonded residues. So we're basically assuming that happens, that's also been uh, absorbed into these six degrees of freedom we're throwing away, which are the whole residue translation and rotational degrees of freedom. So that's one more reason why um, that's important to do, to, to remove these six lowest degrees of freedom. Frequencies and then vibrational entropy. Uh, the conformational term is the same as before with the, with the flexible adaptive dihedrals. So we're looking now at a set of 74 proteins, each one in a box of water. Again, Gromax software, the Amber 99SB force field, tip 3P water, standard equilibration, and then 50 nanoseconds of data collection. So let's first of all compare with other methods out there. There isn't really the possibility of calculating entropies directly uh, and comparing them with the experiment, but we can compare with other methods that are available. And two of the most common methods used out there for proteins are normal mode analysis and quasi harmonic analysis. So normal mode analysis gets you the entropy from the minimum of, an, of a given energy well. You calculate the Hessian, the second derivative in each of the coordinates well, um, over all the possible coordinates and diagonalize that, get the frequency, get the eigenvalues and get the frequencies for the harmonic oscillator equation from this equation. So we're actually giving, getting very close entropies to that. We're slightly below, um, but otherwise pretty close to the um, entropy at the United atom, sorry, at the normal mode level. We have removed the conformational term because that's not accounted for in the normal mode method. It's just one minimum in this comparison. Now this is the quasi harmonic analysis. By comparison, that uses the coordinate fluctuations in an MD simulation, their covariance. It typically is known to overestimate entropy because you're fitting this large Gaussian to a more complicated energy landscape. And the, the eigenvalues of that matrix give the frequencies in this formulation. So larger fluctuations mean, um, mean lower frequency and more entropy versus normal mode analysis where high curvature means high frequency and therefore low entropy. So you can see that's what we predict, that our, our method is much like for normal, normal mode analysis versus quasi-harmonic. We get a much 
um, lower entropy compared to the larger entropy, so like 40 versus 25 kilojoules per mole per kelvin for these range of proteins. So, so these are all the 74 proteins here, just what their total entropy is. So we're getting pretty much the expected values of entropy compared to other methods. But we do have a number of nice features. And of course, one nice feature is we get this decomposition of entropy over these multiple length scales. So first of all, you can just see the multiple length scale. That's fairly uninteresting because it's just it largely relates to the mass of the molecule or, or generally the even the strengths of the interactions, the, the, the uh, yeah, the how, how polar the residues are and how the, how they interact with the environment, how, how narrow that energy well is. So this is rotation in red, rotor vibrational and transvibrational in blue. It's pretty small, but the residue entropy is more interesting. So here now we can see that more of the entropy is actually rotor vibrational and transvibrational. And there's, it generally is a extensive trend. So the larger the protein, the more entropy there is. So it's nothing terribly surprising in that regard. But this, this, this is the typical size of that entropy treating the, essentially in the protein backbone. That's what we're looking at here. Then we have the united atom level. So this is the inside a residue, how flexible it is. And as you can see, there's still more rotor vibrational than trans vibrational. We also know have the, con have the conformational term, which is smaller as other studies have shown. And this is just the distribution of those values. Again, it's always pretty um, extensive, scaling to the size of the, of, the, uh, of the protein. So of course, just for a protein, I should have said, there's always one protein. Um, but obviously, if you're generalizing this method to a larger system, when you had multiple proteins, then this, this would now start to spread out. But these are all just monomers in this case. But just one key point to note here is that the entropy at the residue level is more or less the same kind of size, about you know, six to eight for the larger proteins, as the entropy at the nitro atom level. So even though you have many more nitro atoms than residues, the nitro atoms are much more constrained because you have more covalent bonds basically keeping them locked in. Whereas at the residue level, there's typically only two covalent bonds per residue in the polymer chain. So there's less confinement and that kind of cancels out giving similar kinds of entropy overall. Now let's consider the entropy per amino acid. So we're looking at, this is pretty much the same kind of story. We're looking, we have the three kinds of term, translation, rotation, and confirmation, or with a vibrational rotation or translation. It generally scales with the size of the amino, amino acid. We have the 20, 20 amino acids in alphabetical order and by the three letter codes. And these are the MCC values. We're gonna compare with quasi harmonic analysis and as you can see, there's a, there's a wider variation with quasi-harmonic than there is with, with MCC. And generally they're larger for quasi-harmonic as well. Um, there's not anything too surprising here. As you'd expect, only the flexible side chains have conformational entropy. Uh, there is some variation in the transvibrational, which generally goes with the size of the amino acid. But even, even, even in glycine, you're going to get some, this includes the backbone. So glycine has got a small amount of entropy in the NH and the CH2 as for their wobbling. Alanine, of course, gains a methyl twist. So you can sort of see, that if you worked through all the amino acids, you see that there'd be some patterns when you compare comparable amino acids like, um, well, E and, e and D going to, from aspartate to glutamate, you get slightly more entropy, but it, just having an extra chain, extra CH2 group. I won't go into this too much, but you can get this insight. This is just an average over all proteins and all environments, but you could break this down according to how you wanted to, if you, if you wished, for your protein of interest. But now we're gonna break down a bit further into how the entropy depends upon the environment of the amino acid. So this is the united atom term for each of the 20 amino acids. Uh, it's a function of solvent accessible surface area. So how buried the amino acid is. And we're looking at the rotation or the row vibrational component and the trans vibrational component. So there's a lot of information in this figure. We have the 20 amino acids and generally you can see rotation is typically larger. Uh, you can see for some amino acids, there's not much variation. 
as a function of environment, like the alanine or glutamine, well, at least for the vibrational. Whereas for others, well, especially for, actually for the trans vibrational, there's a lot of variation for other amino acids, like, like arginine, asparagine, uh, sorry, um, and aspartate, a bit less so. And that's clearly because, well, these are more flexible amino acids, they're larger amino acids. It's not as surprising, but you can pick out this variability quite nicely. You can also, well, you can pick out for cysteine, there's two obvious kinds of row vibrational entropy according to whether it's a disulfide linked bridge or not. Uh, you can see the chain terminally. So these squares and triangles are actually the values when you have that amino acid at the terminus. Um, triangle is the end terminus and, sorry, the um, C terminus and the, the square is the end terminus. So according to how often that amino acid is at that terminus, you can see that the entropy is typically a bit larger because there's an extra degree of freedom also to, to move. Um, and the other trend I guess you could notice, which, which is kind of interesting, is that there's the blue values do actually decrease for the, for the widely spread ones. So many of the amino acids show a slight decrease in vibrational entropy as a function of solvent exposure. So it means the more exposed they are, the, the less vibrational entropy they have. And that really perplexed us and still does a bit. Like we wonder whether that's a real effect, whether there's some artifact going on, but it kind of implies, my idea was essentially that a protein next to water is having many more hydrogen bonds than a protein typically buried in the protein. So there's more stronger, interact stronger interactions for amino, amino acid on the surface of a protein compared to buried in the protein. And that's what lowers its vibrational entropy, the size of the energy well. And that of course goes against what you'd expect for a protein on the surface, which you think would be more flexible. And it is actually more flexible when you consider the conformational entropy. So that's the number of rot rotomers or the number of dihedrals. So here we now, we've combined the rotational and vibration and translation into just, just vibrational, the purple term, which decreases weekly. And now we include the conformational entropy, which as you can see, increases the more flexible, the, residue, the larger the residue and also the more solvent exposed the residue is, as you would expect. So these terms seem to anti or go against or anti-correlate, which is kind of interesting. And you can see that if we now combine these terms they, together to give the total entropy per residue, this is now the black term, you can see it's pretty constant. We're, look, we're comparing here now the MCC value versus the quasi-harmonic value. And you can see the entropy from the MCC value is pretty constant as a function of solvent exposure, whereas the quasi-harmonic values are much more variable. And really they, they get almost unphysical in the size of the values, like 300 joules per kilogram per mole. It's getting towards a gas phase entropy value for a comparable size molecule. So we think that there's, it's that aspect of quasi-harmonic of fitting a broad minimum of energy, over many energy wells is clearly overestimating entropy for these very flexible residues. Um, whereas MCC generally seems to suggest that the entropy is fairly constant as a function of solvent exposure, solvent exposure. So one other feature of MCC is the conver convergence time. Down here, you can see we've plotted, I just chose one protein showing the convergence as a function of, um, we ran this one for a bit longer, 100 nanoseconds. So you can see the, after 50 nanoseconds, the entropy is pretty well converged for MCC, whereas quasi-harmonic takes a lot longer to converge. Now this seems to generally just come down to the size of the matrices being considered. Because in MCC, we have multiple matrices that are generally smaller. That means the noise the, or the convergence of the matrix is much faster. Whereas quasi-harmonic, which, which has one matrix for the whole system, whether it, it could be um, heavy atoms or alpha carbons, obviously the fewer residues you have, the, the faster it converges or the fewer atoms you have. But uh, that's only one reason why it takes longer, of course. There's the other reason about the, the broad, min broad minima. But generally, forces converge much faster than coordinates. That's another feature we found. So there's a few features that are contributing, the forces versus coordinates, and also the multiple length scales. 
that bring about a much faster convergence in time. And one of the key features of this method is really, well, that's what I'll just wrap up with really. Um, I'll say we have presented this multi-scale formulation to calculate entropy from the flexibility of correlated rigid body units at multiple length scales. And we're reproducing well the experimental free energies of host gas binding, which are consistent with, um, and for proteins, these values are consistent with normal mode analysis, which is known to be reasonable for analyzing and analyzing protein entropy. Uh, we've shown how the entropy contributes to binding by being a large gain for water versus a loss in the guest's positional, orientational, and conformational entropy. And we've shown for the protein that the entropy at the residue level is pretty comparable to that at the nitrogen atom level. And also there's this interesting um, cancellation between the conformational and transvibrational terms, which leads to little variation with solvent exposure. And the nice thing about this method is that it accounts for all relevant degrees of freedom of the system. It operates at multiple length scales. And that of course is very important for scaling to even larger systems and it converges fast, which is also important. And that's of course the direction we wish to go in to be able to take this to more molecules, um, larger kinds of assemblies. So going to another level of hierarchy, perhaps uh, for uh, protein assemblies and protein, uh, different kinds of uh, environment like lipid membranes, for example. So fun to thank a number of people. So most recent work was done by, on the host guest systems was Hafid Sakib Ali with Jazz Kalyan doing the solvation term theory and Agaya Chakravorty who's now at the University of Michigan with Charlie Brooks. He helped, he was at the time doing his PhD with Emil Alexov in Clemson. He helped both with the code for the host gas system and the protein entropy. It's, it's the same code being used there. Whereas our, our solvent code is still a bit different, um, but we're planning to integrate that in the near future. I've also had a fair amount of help over the years with, from Franco Greta at HITS and the Heidelberg Institute of Theoretical, Theoretical Studies and Ulf Henson, we kind of made some helpful advances in the past, looking at the covariance term to generalize the flexible molecules. And finally, David Mobley, who has run the sample challenge, which was one of the test systems, systems, test systems we could use for this method. And finally, these funding bodies who've helped uh, fund these students and postdocs and, and me for some of this research. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Richard. Uh, we started to get a few questions. Um, so first one from Agastya. Uh, thank you for this nice talk. I was wondering how long does it take typically to get the delta S entropy values for a protein of say around 100, 300 amino acids? Um, I think for a general the idea of how long it's, it's still maybe um, about five minutes, I suppose, that sort of length scale. These proteins were on the, on the size of 100 amino acids, sort of 50 to 150 amino acids. I think it could be streamlined. Like I've, when you see how fast some of the analysis programs like CP, TRAG and AMBER and so on run, uh, they, you can um, get fast optimization, but there is, there is a bit of calculation. The IO is one part, but there is some calculation in, in getting all the reference frames, doing the multi-scale formulation, you've got to kind of get all the uh, units into local reference frames, doing some coordinate transformation. So that takes a little bit of code, but it's all quite fast. And there's no, there's no severely scaling feature. It's generally fairly extensive, just with the, with the size of the system. Um, of course, the matrices need to be diag diagonalized, but if you were ever going to have a larger and larger protein, it would then probably be optimal to break it up into smaller units. So you're hopefully getting that kind of um, sort of particle mesh style decomposition of the system that you don't, you never actually have a matrix that's too big, it takes too long. Uh, but that we haven't, of course, for proteins, there's a fairly natural length scale to use to de define these units. 
it is an approximation to define them. They're a bit arbitrary to some degree. Um, in general, you'd like to have an automated way of defining units, but um, I think it would generally typically be much, much less than the time scale to run the simulation. So it wouldn't really be a major consideration. The solvent term could be a bit more because the solvent molecules are a large component of the system and they have the most amount of entropy typically as we saw for the host gas system. So if you're looking, if you happen to do some kind of analysis of the solvent in a very refined fashion, then there's a bit more overhead there, but it's not really um, that much. Um, so yeah, generally I'd say a few, five minutes would be a typical time scale. Mm. And another question from Lars Schaefer. How does the convergence of the entropy with simulation time depend on the frequency at which the coordinates or forces are stored to disk? Right, we have examined that a few times and generally it doesn't make that much difference um, over certain periods of time. So of course it does in extreme cases when you have a huge amount of every, every femtosecond of sampling over a, over a picosecond, that wouldn't give a very useful value. But typically, locally, forces do converge very fast because you 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 don't have to sample over a very long period to sample the vibrational time scale of a of a vibration. But of course, for protein, for a large system with conformational sampling, you have to sample for a long time to try and access all the relevant conformations. So as long as you're sampling for a long enough time scale to see the relevant conformational change you care about, then it didn't make that much difference really, whether you chose to, um, we had a thousand frames, I think for our, our convergence plots, but we could probably have chosen uh, a 10th as long say, and taken 10 times as many values. And it would not have, it would not change the entropy very much. I haven't got the data here right now. We have done some test cases for other systems and we saw it didn't make that much difference. But so within reason of what you might run a simulation for, you can get out a reasonable estimate of force, sort of a local vibrational term with some local fast time scale of confirmation entropy, fairly well converged as long as you save enough, save enough for the kind of resolution of, um, length scale you're looking at, like how big your matrices are. We haven't maybe done the full systematic analysis yet because, um, well, we're just making it work. But in, in principle, you could work out what the best sort of time scale would be for a given system size and hierarchy of structure. Okay, thank you. And the next question is one I think a few people have. Um, and that is, is there a software package that implements this? Is there something available that people can get a hold of to do it themselves? Yeah, I didn't mention that. So uh, the Agaya Chakravorty wrote a code on GitHub. It's published in this, it's refer, referenced in, I haven't got the link here, in this paper here, just published last year in the Journal of Chemical Information and Modeling. In this paper here, um, well, it's, it's, on, it's, it's referenced in the code. So that does the protein entropy. And we use that entropy for also for the host and guest systems. Uh, for the solvent term, we're using the code written by Jazz Kalyan. So we actually have two separate codes just because we were each different people were working on, the, on them at the time. So we hadn't combined it into a single uh, uniform code, but we have got, that should also be on GitHub fairly soon. Jazz is just currently finishing up and she's finalizing her code. Um, so that's should be should be available. It's not quite as optimized yet as Argo's code, um, and we're wanting to obviously combine these codes into a single code that would give out the total entropy over both solutes and solvent um, and or ions as well, anything that mixtures all the other components that might be in the system. Um, but that's still under development. Just at the moment, there's the there is right now the code for the protein, There's, there will be code very shortly for the solvent and, um, and the ions in the solvent and hopefully soon for everything. And, but of course, we'd like to be able to have more general code as well that would do assemblies and, and 
uh, different kinds of molecule. At the moment, the protein code is specific to proteins, um, but it, it's not very hard to generalize it to other kinds of biomolecule, but we just haven't done that yet. Okay, so the next question from Cyril: How does MCC compare with 2PT? So in terms of liquid performance, um, 2PT has generally been applied to liquids. They're pretty comparable. They have a lot of features in common. I do have one or two slides and I don't remember, whoops, I've just gone to the end and it stopped sharing. Um, I had a slide and I've taken off 2PT. Um, I, th this, we, we did do some comparisons to 2PT and this was a comparison looking at a whole bunch of liquids. So this is, this is 58 liquids. Um, you can just see them all listed here that we looked at the entropies of using this decomposition I mentioned, molecule and, fiber and um, united atom. And this was the comparison against experiment to the total entropy. So we're getting this kind of um, accuracy compared to experiment um, for two different force fields. Um, I didn't, this is, this is actually more accurate than 2PT. So I think we are doing better than 2PT. Um, which I think tended to underestimate. This paper gives more detail about the comparison with 2PT, but it does pretty well for smaller rigid solutes, but it didn't seem to do as well for flexible solutes. Um, I mean, they're definitely harder than flexible liquids, but we managed to get reasonable agreement for those. Um, but, but 2PT has got some strength. Like it does obviously, it's a, it's a combination method of two phases, crystal and gas, and it does the limits of crystal and gas very well by definition, really. Um, and so it's by no means, I think one method is better than the other. They just have um, different strengths, um, but we, we seem to work pretty well for liquids and we, our multi-scale formulation, it's possible that could be done for 2P2, I guess, as well, uh, makes it much more easy to apply for proteins. I haven't seen 2PT applied to proteins. Um, it, it does, the data you have to save for 2PT is a bit more awkward because you've got to save velocity autocorrelation functions at a high time frequency at, at the sort of 10 per second time scale to get that well, a well um, converged time correlation function. So that's a bit more awkward for biosimulations because typically you're, so, you're saving every picosecond or 10 picoseconds which is not so amenable to a high frequency plus the autocorrelation function. And they seem to also use NVT more than NPT uh, for technical reasons. So that's also a bit of a limitation. So there's some technical issues compared to 2PT and there's also just some, uh, uh, or how well you can adapt it to, sorry, I'm not needing to show you <laughs> noble gas salvation, but there's also some, um, unless you want to see it, some uh, practical issues and how they can be scaled to different kinds of system. Okay, and the next question from Dario. Um, in your simulations, have you done any intrinsically disordered proteins? And if so, did you see any particular behavior with them compared to other proteins? Yeah, well, I guess that's, that question is best answered by Agaya Chakraborty who uh, He's probably asleep right now. So he, he um, ha is now in his, in his postdoc looking at sort of proteins. And like I said, um, I mean, you can, this method does work. It will work for the sort of proteins. You can apply it. But um, one caveat I gave was that this topographical term for at the residue level, which relates to the packing of the chains, should be, it could still be small, but it, it will definitely be of interest. Like it won't, it may not be a large contribution to entropy, but it will certainly be a term of interest to, ca to characterize how the shape of the protein is changing. And of course you have all the sampling problems as well for a much larger, a much more complicated complex landscape requiring longer, sim longer simulations. But you could still get up values for all these other terms without much difficulty. Uh, the, where, where, yeah, there's a slight issue about superposition for a very flexible molecule. So if the protein was really changing shape a lot and you're getting out its principal axes or moments of inertia, principal, um, the moments of inertia from the, um, from the 
you need those for the rotational term, which uses the moments of inertia. That could be a bit problematic when you've got a very flexible protein. I mean, it doesn't affect it too much. You kind of get an ensemble average over the moments of inertia. And so it's not an unphysical value, but it just might be, it might require a more sophisticated analysis. So certainly disorder proteins are more problematic. You might use another hierarchy of length scales if it's got rigid domains and flexible domains, for example, you might just yeah, use, use a domain as an intermediate length scale. You might use secondary structure also as, a, as a, another possible um, level of hierarchy, having helices as rigid body units or, or um, bent helices as two units or various things like that. Um, but it does get a bit more complicated when you have variable units, like a if you had a helix coil transition, you might have a helix as a rigid body unit some of the time, and then a, and then a coil some of the other time. So it, it would be uh, a more general step to be able to make the code handle that kind of case. It can kind of handle it, but it um, might be more accurate if you're able to making more automation more flexible. And that, that we haven't done, but we're obviously just trying to work, build this up in uh, one step at a time. Okay, um, next question um, from Warren. Thanks for the great talk. Is it possible to use this method to evaluate the contribution of solvent molecules in protein-protein interactions? Oh, yeah, very much so. Yeah, I mean, it's, it'd be the exact same principle as what I was talking about for the host guest system. You would just have two proteins. I suppose just now they're probably comparable. They, well, they may or may not be comparable sizes. It doesn't matter that one molecule is bigger than the other. They can be any comparative size. And you would just apply it in the exact same way as for the host guest system. You'd just be having more length scales uh, than just than just two length scales. For the, for the first... Um, case, uh, sorry, for this kind of system here, we just had two length scales for the host guest system, but for the protein-protein binding case, you would have the protein term. The theory is very modular. You can put it together quite easily. There's no real uh, theoretical reason why you can't. I mean, there might be an approximation that gets a bit more uh, approximate, stronger, doing this kind of thing, but I think to a large degree it holds up pretty well. So you could just apply the, the theory to a protein um, and another protein either separately or bound and the solvation entropy, solvent entropy also, well, uh, in the same way. I only break down the solvent, obviously for protein, you've got many more kinds of solvent environment. Uh, I only broke it down into four kinds of solvents, like water with the host, water with the guest, you, and so on. You could break it down into water around any amino acid or any nitrogen atom to get a really high level of refinement. So you could analyze how the solvent at the interface or uh, the binding or wherever you're interested in the binding pocket, that could be done. We just didn't do that um, detailed analysis here just because just it was, well, it could be done, but um, obviously it gets more and more um, complex the more you do it that way. But yes, you could apply it to a protein protein mining system. Our code just hasn't yet been adapted to do, to do that just yet. Well, actually we could do that, but just with a bit of fiddling around. Okay. And I guess as well as protein protein complexes, it would equally be able to apply to like protein ligand binding as well as other guest host systems? Oh yeah, yep. Yeah. I mean, that's, there's no, as I was saying for the host guest system, you could replace the host with a protein and do the exact same kind of thing as before. Uh, so yeah, there's no, these are just two systems we've studied so far. And we essentially wanted to, we just chose them because well, proteins are a key system to do. And it was simpler just to do the protein first and not worry about the solvent at the time. And host guest system, again, is, is a classic binding case. And it's simpler to consider a rigid host compared to a flexible, a more larger, more flexible host. But you could just replace the host with a protein and it would be the same kind of thing. But 
obviously it does still get more complicated. You could have multiple binding modes and so on. Uh, you could have uh, allosteric binding sites for the protein has a different conformation in the unbound form to the bound form. So you'd have to worry about or peak protonation and all those things have to be worried about, of course, for a protein. Um, conformational chain and docking of the guest and knowing the, the, the structure of the bound form. It, it's, not, it's not like this solves all the problems there, but just given that given you have a known structure and a known complex, you can then apply this theory to those particular states and, and get out the answers, the entropy contributions. Okay. Um, let's see for the next question. Um, can you apply this method to simulations that used umbrella sampling or freezing part of the system? Or does it have to be like unconstrained simulation data? Analysis? Yes, so we actually have done that once. Uh, we looked at, we, we looked at a system for an umbrella sampling simulation. And that was in the context of a chemical reaction. We did try this using a QMMM formulation to look at a simple nucleophilic substitution reaction. And we wanted to look at the transition stage and the reactant to get the activation energy. It's, it, so it has, we have done that. It is, uh, you've got to worry about the, the force due, due to the restraint is not, that'll contribute to the force that would be included in the entropy. So we, remove that degree of freedom along the umbrella potential because that was the, that force keeping it along that degree of freedom was in a way the imaginary mode that you remove anyway. So we removed it. In, this, in our case, it wasn't imaginary. It was just harmonic because it was held by the restraint, but we remove it. And otherwise every other degree of freedom, presumably is just doing its own thing at equilibrium given the restraint. So of course it's not, it's, a, it's still a potential mean force. It, it's, a, it's just a function of that coordinate. So it isn't the full equilibrium value. It's as a function of that coordinate. So you've got to interpret it carefully. That will change the function of the coordinate. But yes, it can be, you just apply the code to your ensemble of structures. And one, one key thing that you do have, to do have to do with these sort of simulations, I should have emphasized, is you've got to save forces as a trajectory. You, typically people would only be saving coordinates most commonly in their trajectories, in their simulations. And so this in a way doubles the amount of data you have to save if you want to do this kind of calculation. But the forces is a pretty informative quantity about the nature of the, what the atoms are experiencing in the simulation. It tells you locally what an atom is feeling uh, in, in the simulation. And that information of course is what's being used in this calculation. Um, you get you get that much more in a way more directly from forces than you do just from coordinates. So it isn't like you get it for free. You have to save this extra bit of data. But that's what for any for anything you do in your simulations, if you want to do this, you use this method. You have to save the forces as well for the for the vibrational term. For the topographical term, that's just purely from coordinates. But the vibrational term requires forces. Um, I suppose you could, in principle, use a an LM method that uses coordinates instead of forces and try and get out like quasi harmonic analysis in a sort of multi-scale fashion. That's a, another kind of idea, a combination of ideas you could explore if you wanted to avoid having to say forces. But we found for liquids, forces are quasi harmonic is really hard, really almost impossible to apply for liquids. Um, there's a method called permutation reduction, which does that in a kind of way from the Grubmuller group. But otherwise, it's much more difficult to get vibrational entropy from coordinates. So forces are, have a big advantage there for liquids, for the liquid component, but also for flexible solutes as well. Great. Um, my next question, have you examined the influence of different thermostats on the results? Uh, not directly. Oh, well, a long time ago we did. We're generally using a Langevin thermostat. We know the Berenson thermostat definitely was problematic and we, we saw some awkward things there. It was more so for like looking at solvation free energies when you have a gas phase molecule and the internal entropy, internal vibration is really poorly equilibrated for the Berenson thermostat. It just gives a completely wrong answer. So 
the Zalantrivan ones seem to work fine for us. Um, but we haven't really varied that ever since. But we haven't explored all the other thermostats. But in principle, it shouldn't make any more difference compared, as long as I was getting a, getting a Boltzmann distribution, an equilibrium distribution, then I think it should work fine. Um, but there might be some issues. I don't, I, I'm not fully up on all the technicalities of each thermostat and what might be their strengths and weaknesses, but I don't see why this couldn't be applied regardless of the thermostat, apart from the issue I mentioned. Although we have been using the Barrison Barrow stat, it doesn't seem to make that much of a problem for pressure. Okay. And so what sort of, what are the limits on scaling in terms of system sizes or protein sizes? The limits of yeah. scaling. The larger so, or small can you get? Yeah. The, so just to show that figure we had before, we looked at our proteins vary from 50 to 200 amino acids. So obviously you might want to go to 500 or 2000 or something like that to look at much larger proteins. Uh, th these, these matrices are quite small for at the residue level. So they're going to be, it's just three N where N is the number of amino acids. So you can, in terms of memory and so on and diagonalizing the matrix, it's, it's generally within reach for a typical protein. As long as you're, as long as you're even for a thousand residues, that's a 3000 matrix that's doable because for, an atom level matrix that would be much much harder because then you'd be having ten thousand atoms, twenty thousand atoms, which makes a more problematic size of matrix. But that said, if we do in implement other levels of hierarchy, you could you could look at if you have some huge I don't know, collagen, some big molecule that has a lot of uh, a huge size, then you might want to break it up into other length scales. Intermediate, intermediate length scales and then bring about the scaling. So there's no real limit to how many length scales you could have. You just keep, could keep adding on. Um, I don't quite know. There isn't, I suppose, there's an issue to be explored about what the approximation is in having these, these in a way, um, different length scales. You're, you're assuming that the the entropy you throw away due to double counting is is clean and there's no kind of overlap. And obviously if you're just having like one, two, four, eight, sixteen as your levels of amino acid doubling every time in your hierarchy, there might be something that some kind of if it's too often, there might be some kind of strange artifact of doing that. We haven't explored that really yet. But so the answer is yes, it can scale, I think, quite well, but it and the having new hierarchies would help, even if that were a problem with the, with the size, but there could still be a problem with the hierarchy itself. But as we saw, we, get, we got similar values for normal mode analysis. So we think we're still generally capturing all the flexibility. There's, we think the normal modes are more, in a way, more intuitive you know, because they're they're not these huge N body or three, three N degrees of freedom vibrational modes over the whole system. They're more localized, which is a common technique used in analysis of all kinds of systems, whether it's quantum mechanics or, or coordinates. So it makes them a bit sort of easy to understand. Okay. Um, so the next question is, in principle, entropy can be estimated using the temperature gradient from a free energy calculation using you know, standard sampling techniques. What yeah. are the limitations of that approach compared to MCC? Well, yeah, it's a, obviously um, that's pretty much the method that mirrors what experiment does essentially, or almost not quite. Experiment typically measures the heat capacities and gets entropy from that, but generally, we wanted to get a method that gave the insight, gave the decomposition over the whole system and the, gave the full probability distribution function of entropy. And the method of getting entropy from the temperature derivative, derivative of the Gibbs energy difference doesn't really do that. It just gives you the entropy difference from the Gibbs energy difference. And so 
that typically involves having to do at least at least two simulations at different temperatures and or uh, a second derivative, which is a bit more messy. But the simplest way is just to do a difference. Or actually, you can subtract the enthalpy and get the entropy from G equals S equals G minus H over T. So that's also possible, or H minus G. But generally, we felt the most common audience would be somebody running a simulation of a system of interest. And we thought that was the kind of target system to get this method to work for. And we didn't want to have to add extra requirements like running extra simulations at different temperatures or running like in the alchemical methods, they also give the free energy difference, which can be temperature driven, dramatized. That requires lots of simulations of intermediate states, which of course is a, is a huge amount of work going into that kind of system. And that works great, of course, for protein ligand systems, but not so easy, say, for protein, protein binding. Um, but it's still having to require a lot more additional simulations. Whereas this is all just, well, you've got to run the simulation of the system of interest. So for binding, that still means you've got to run four simulations of, of these four different cases, but it's still a lot less than, than uh, every permutation of, well, of binders or every intermediate state for a given binding situation. Okay, and we have another question here. Do you think MCC can be applied for studying and harmonicity? Okay, so there's a few aspects about anharmonicity. And one, one aspect I'd always like to kind of emphasize is MCC derives a one of the sort of classical contexts that people talk about anharmonicity is for normal mode analysis in that it fits a harmonic potential to the minimized geometry at zero Kelvin. And then people will typically apply that curvature to a thermal ensemble at a given temperature, like room temperature. And so typically the curvature at the zero point is not the same as the curvature at the temperature of interest. And so that brings about what people call an anharmonicity. They say the, the curvature is different, it's because of anharmonic effects. And therefore, uh, you've got to make some kind of correction, like frequency scaling, typically scaling them down, to account for this different curvature at the minimum versus at room at room temperature. Now, MCC actually, one nice thing about it is it actually fits to thermalized, um, a thermalized ensemble. So these minima, it's actually fitting to a whole lot of structures at the temperature of interest. So even though it's making the harmonic approximation, it's fitting it to the temperature of interest, not to the ground state minimum, the zero point minimum. And so you're, you're not having to, uh, in a way, it's not as severe a harmonic approximation because it's fitted to the ensemble of interest, not, not the ensemble at zero Kelvin. Now, it's still, um, if you run different temperatures, you'll get out different curvatures. You'll see some dependence the, of the frequency. So there is, of course, a dependence of the curvature on frequency, or on temperature. And of course, there is still a um, harmonic approximation. And that depends upon the degree of freedom as to how approximate that is. So for, for an internal molecule at the nitrogen atom level, it's a pretty good approximation because these bonded degrees of freedom are very high frequency. For the conformational term, it's a bit less, depends upon, of course, how flexible the dihedral is. If it's a very constrained one, like in a ring, it's a good one. But if it's a hydrocarbon twisting, then that that might be start to start to break down. Uh, at least be a bit more approximate the harmonic approximation. Now, for non-bonded degrees of freedom, for translation, it's pretty good translational vibration because of if you look at the force distribution for a molecule in solution, it's very close to Gaussian extremely close to Gaussian. For, for Leonard Jones liquid with the Leonard Jones potential being a bit harder, it's a bit less Gaussian, but for molecules like water with that collection of Leonard Jones and electrostatic, it's quite close to Gaussian. So you get, it's a very good approximation. For rotation, it's pretty good, except for very non-polar molecules like methane in water. They almost tumble like a free rotor, like a methane molecule or a benzene molecule about its long axis, about its um, 
axis of um, or the wheel axis for benzene, they're a little more um, approximate there. So, but for most typical molecules, they're constrained by the molecule, constrained by the water environment in a quite tight local and vibrational well. So it's, it is pretty close to harmonic. So those are, but that said, it would be nice to go beyond the Gaussian approximation and maybe do something like what you do in quantum mechanics with multiple Gaussians. Uh, I've seen people do this already um, with quasi-harmonic analysis using multiple Gaussians to get around this, to get around the, um, the single minimum approximation, which is known to be, is no, been known for a long time to be a poor approximation of the quasi-harmonic. So you might use multiple Gaussians there and that would improve the accuracy. Okay, and we have one last question. And this was about the simulation protocol you were running. Um, yeah. And it was, why do you need to minimize the system before the equilibration? Okay, so definitely the 10,000 steps for me is, is more than you need to do. That was um, what was done. Um, it's typically just because you set the protein up uh, from a PDB structure and added solvent. And so it may not be, there could be some steric clash that makes the MD simulation unstable. And so you might just need to get even 100 steps, I think is enough typically just to remove the steric clash. But it's very fast, so you can do a lot of minimization um, just to be on the safe side. But yeah, when you warm it up again, typically you've just undone most of what you did or a lot of what you did in the minimization. So it's not at all essential. It's just to remove uh, steric strain to make the MD simulation stable and yeah, converging. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Richard. It was a great talk. You really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you very much.